Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. And it's a pleasure to be back. It's a pleasure to learn with you, to be with you, to pray with you. Uh, admittedly, uh, I and many of you are a little hungover, no? A little hungover after Wednesday night, Thursday. I don't just mean perhaps you got a little shickered. You know, that's fine. It's legal, right? Just to the point you don't know the difference between Haman and Mordechai. Yeah, it was firm, right? We, uh, and, you know, I, I teach at Tarbut Torah. It's near Newport Beach, so I asked anybody if they lived in a gated community so we could extend the party another 24 hours, because as you know, Shushan Purim, gated communities, took it the next day. So there were a number of it in the Newport Coast, gated community. It was fine for us to celebrate. All right. So I do love Purim for its masechot. Uh, what is a masecha? Hag Purim, you have a masecha, yeah, which is a mask. So you get to wear masks. And in fact, when uh, tradition, halakha, says this is the only day you are allowed, if you are a woman, to dress as a man and a man to dress as a woman, to trans, so to speak, this is the one day you're allowed to. I think people miss the uh, point entirely. This is not about trans at all. Let me just say this clearly. If someone has that identity that is coming uniquely and authentically from themselves, it has nothing to do with a masecha, which is a mask, which is precisely the opposite of who you are. So, what was I for Purim? I was an introvert. Yes, it was liberate. Let me tell you, I, I, I know you're an extrovert, so I'm just going to say, it's so liberating to be the opposite of who you are for a day. To be this masecha, this mask of filling in this identity, I learned things about myself that I never knew possible just by being not me. But that's for one day. We turn it on its head, and I don't think it's a coincidence that we read the, and I'm going to retranslate this for you, the golden calf on this day. Because in Hebrew, we call it the golden calf, but what is the golden calf in Hebrew? Egel ha ma se ha. It is the, and I don't want to say calf, because an egel is really a bull. I mean, it's it's a little more vigorous than... I, I don't know, what is it? Calf, I, th I think more like... Oh, hee, hee. No, this, this is like... Yeah. And yeah, I'll get to bull in a second. We're going to get there, but uh, that's a metaphor. Um, but masecha, so is it a mask of a bull? No. Why is it a egel masecha? And we know this from Aaron, at least when he does it, not how he explains it to Moses, if you remember now. Let's go back to the Torah portion, which said, Moses, what do you do? You just did a terrible wrong for the Israelite people. And he said, no, 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 no. I took their gold, I threw it in the fire, and out came this bull. Okay. Bull shlacha, as we say uh, in TVT. That is not true. He actually built a mold. He built a mask. He didn't build the mask, he built the mold for the mask that they poured their gold into, and that created the idol. So the challenge that I have, the drash that I have for you today, is the idol the object, or is the idol really the thing that we build around the absence that we are so scared so we fill all of our time and our resources and stuff into that mold, which becomes the mask that we wear every day. That is the idol. Not the tchotchke. The need to fill the absence, which is truly the will of God. The inspiration of Hashem. That fragile, shimmering effervescence within each of us and all of us. And so a few examples of this masechot, this need to fill in. We know this because originally Aaron didn't want it to be a golden calf at all. Aaron said to the ladies, and I find this a little misogynistic, it's a little sexist, but hey ladies, give me your gold. What did he think they were going to say? Uh-uh. No, are you kidding me? I got this back in Hawaii like six years ago. This is my like precious uh, 
precious object, he thought that they wouldn't give them their gold. But as Midrash tells us, in absence, we'll do anything to fill the space. Now let's think about it. What does it begin with in the Parsha about how they started their idolatry? They got nervous. Moses was having a honeymoon. He took the extension. He said, let's take a little long. It's so good. Is anybody? Okay, so on a rainy day, I know. I'm. By the way, kola kavod for coming to shul today. And this kind of day, this is one of those devil comforter days. You just want to stay a little longer under the covers. When Moses and God spent so long up there in this bliss bubble, that's when people got ma- that's when people got nervous. That's when people needed something to fill. That which didn't need to be filled. Aaron in that moment was really worried. Frankly, they, they gathered on him, literally on him, not because he was worried that they were uh, going to run away or to sin. They were worried they were going to kill him. So he needed an object to replace that which left. Now, whether that's Moses or whether that's God, it actually says both. Because as someone in our Torah study said today, Ha Elohim could be the judges or the God. And so when they build this form, when they build this form, it is so easily flown into. The fear of absence is so great. In art history, we call this horror vacui. The horror of this emptiness. Because, as I said earlier in the introduction, if we don't believe in God, we cannot have tchotchkes, but then we don't believe in anything, and that absence is terrifying. Not awesome, because you can really stand within that space, but that fear that there is nothing there, there's nothing to be, and then I don't know what to do. So notice how quickly Aaron jumps. Okay, no worries. Take your gold. Let's do this. We'll make this form. Hey, all right, God. This is God. It is absence that is the trigger for idolatry. It is boredom that is the trigger for this type of fetishizing the object, the substance, rather than the spirit. Now, God forbid, and I know, your revered rabbi, Rabbi Spitz, has been gone a long time. Okay? He's spending a lot of time, right, meditating on the mountain, so to speak. Now, I know he's coming back in two weeks, thank God. He'll be back soon. But this is always the moment that things get scary. Now, what may be, whoa, what are we doing here? Why is our purpose here? What are we doing? And in this moment, I pray to you, if I'm Aaron, it's not, hey, let's do disco Shabbos. I think it's the perfect time, guys. That's filling the space with a mold that you know will return and be filled with spirit, that same spirit that you always have, Let him stay on the mountain. Precious things happen in absence and presence. And I bless his Shabbatical. Because I would think, you know, I used to say as a rabbi, what does a rabbi take if if he does Shabbos every week? Do we take a satanical? No. (laughs) He's really resting. He's filling Vayinafash. It will serve your community for years. Now, I say this, I switched from Rabbi Spitz to my family just as a segue, but, you know, my kid now is 13 going on 40, but going on 14, he wants to be responsible. He's babysitting right now. He's babysitting. And I've got all the Shabbos rules laid out. Everything's there. They know the rules. They're, God willing, okay. They're safe. I know they are. But if I spend a little too long at Kiddush, whose fault is that? And we all know this feeling. I used to do this with you guys in school. I would let you guys do what you did and then come in. Uh, huh? And how angry. Just remember as a parent, when you gave, you needed to do something else, you're going to the market, you came back, the kitchen's a, you know, a mess. How angry. How could you, br- how could you let me down? How could you break my heart? Who's guilty there? It's the absence when you're afraid 
You don't know when they're coming back. In that absence, that's when chaos occurs. So what do we do? Honestly, what do I do when I'm nervous that chaos will occur in absence? Frankly, I'm not on Shabbos, but or occasionally on Shabbos, I shove a cell phone in their face, right? I, I give them a tchotchke. Ah, ah, fill the space, fill the space. Pokemon went and goes and went and goes, whatever it may be. It's the moment of idolatry to fill in space that we're uncomfortable with. I'm not calling a cell phone an idol. I'm not. I'm not ca- and there's no waggy finger here. I'm just saying it's so hard. And for children of Israel, children, Regina, who just left Egypt, who have been filled with tchotchkes their entire life, come on. We're all co-responsible for understanding. And as a child, to not have, honestly, tchotchke in hand is almost frightening. I mean, I can get into psychology and Lacan and the object permanence of, let's just say a pacifier isn't just a pacifier, if you know what I mean. We're still using them today. And so finally, I want to turn to our world and our culture. You know, Marx said, religion is the opiate of the masses. I'm going to try this first time here, fresh. I think opiates are the religion of the masses. Yes, today... And it is not out of pain. If we truly assess pain, we don't manage it. We try to understand it. We lean into it. We take the luchot, we take our pain and our suffering, and we try to figure it out. It's scarier than palliation. It's scarier than, frankly, masking the pain. How do you feel? I feel much better. Not really. How do I feel? Well, I don't feel. I just don't feel bad. This is a cultural phenomenon. This is crisis. It's critical times that we are using the very powerful medicines. And look, God bless Sackler at all. I think there's been tremendous progress in how we understand medicines in our nature my concern is it is a spiritual crisis rather than a medical one. And if you ask people who are out of work and they don't know what to do with their time and their lives, sure, they had a bad back. Now, who doesn't have a bad back? I mean, right? I mean, who do- I mean yes, I'm, I'm over 40. There's something wrong. So, look, and God bless. Rapo ra- 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 Why twice? One for God to heal, the second for doctors and medicine to heal. This is not about you know us going into Christian science. That's not it. But I do believe it's a mask. It's a tremendous mask, and it's a peso that we look to to palliate, but to remain disconnected from that fragile self, that absence of what am I going to do with my illness, mental, physical. What am I going to do with boredom? The time that I spend day after day after I have either worked or lost work, my children have left the home, right? My relationship has come to a conclusion. I've lost a loved one. These are, now, it is not a pestle. It is the opportunity of molten bull. It is molten bull that takes us away from ourselves. So now I want to return. Why is this Parsha book ended, Ibn Ezra says? You've got to quote an Ibn Ezra somewhere, right? Between the molten bull, what is book ending this Parsha? What are the Parshiot? It's about the construction of Mishkan. By the way, Ohel Moed and Mishkan, I don't think are the same thing. There's something that's very beautiful about the end of this Parsha, which is the cloud descends, everybody stands out in front of their tent. I just imagine everybody standing next to their desk. Yes, teacher, we will wait for you as you have your meeting. And like my children, yes, we're just here waiting at attention. Did you read that at the end of the Parsha? It's beautiful fantasy. Okay. That's why we have the structure to give the gold. They gave easily for idolatry, they will give readily to provide structures of holiness that give them purpose in life, give us purpose in life. So rather than the idol, create the spaces necessary. If that is education, if it's employment, 
if it's simply a space to be valued as a human soul, like a bowling alley, frankly. Although that's Howard Putnam bowling alone, you guys know this, bowling alone, just the isolation of so many people. We're missing these social opportunities. This guy wrote a Purim tour. He said, I have a great idea. We're going to hold the Purim in the most radical space. It's called synagogue. <laughs> because... This is where we can channel those very same resources to find ourselves fragile, holy, and really fulfilling the first four commandments of being someone unique in the image of God, of refusing to use these idols and, and methods of masking to not believe that this is in vain, that there really is no greater purpose in our lives, to honor that not by stuff, but by presence. And then to turn to your parents and children, as I see so many today, it really warms hearts to remember that it is Evan of the bane. And then the rest, yes, don't do, don't. But so much is based on who we are before what we don't do. So idolatry is fetish as object, sure. But idolatry is fear of absence, even more. And so I pray that in this space and time, in this absence, rather than filling this time with what you might have been, should be doing, could be, take a moment to appreciate how you have preserved your spirit within this time away, within this absence, and truly will come back from the mountain, guys. In fact, it is always there. And so that spirit radiates through all of us. So I wish you a Shabbat Shalom. May you be restored.